Hello dear students, welcome to your online classes. I am your teacher Dr. Zubair Shanib Bhatt and today the topic of my talk is sterilization and disinfection part 1 because the topic is so long so I have to divide it into two parts so next part will be coming uh, online soon. So this class is intended for the students of uh, MLT second year then a court second year as well as a court third year so when we talk about sterilization and disinfection it is all we need to do to control the growth of microorganisms in our health settings so this is the beginning so let's move further ahead let us start with the terminology uh, what is sterilization it is a process uh, where all living organisms including the spores are killed okay so nothing is left behind this is fertilization now coming to the part of uh, coming to the part of now sterilization it can be achieved by various ways and the three different ways that it can be achieved through is physical chemical or physiochemical so in this lecture we will be talking about physical aspects of sterilization and the next uh, lecture will be followed by the chemical and physiochemical okay so it means that there are chemicals that can be used as agents they call we call them as chemisterilants so any chemical that we can use for sterilizing purpose we name it as such now what is disinfection uh, two contrasting ways spores sterilization means complete killing of the microorganisms i am using the term killing here okay and second is uh, in disinfection i am not using the word killing i am saying multiplying disinfection is a process by which we can stop the multiplying of the bacteria so this is the difference between sterilization and disinfection now let us go through the definition of it so it is the elimination of uh, most of the pathogenic organisms which are present uh, in in you know in our uh, any uh, working uh, aspect if you are working with you know, with um, i mean if you are working with cultures so you should be well uh, informed about it so but excluding the spores so uh, in disinfection disinfection doesn't include the spores and spores are usually formed by the gram positive bacteria there uh, uh, one of the examples is uh, for this is b subtilis b subtilis so bacillus is the genus and subtilis is its species so it's a gram positive spore forming bacteria so what do you mean by spore forming so uh, they have a thick peptidoglycan layer on its surface and then in the, in this whole microorganism is covered by spores okay so in this case disinfection cannot eliminate the spores but in case of sterilization it is well able to kill the spores okay so now how can we achieve this infection again uh, same as sterilization we can achieve by uh, physical means not chemical means or and the chemicals that we use them at particular time point we are call them as disinfectants okay so different disinfects have different target ranges so not all disinfects can kill the bacteria but yes they can stop the multiplication okay so some of the methods of disinfection such as filtration we'll be discussing later on it does not kill the bacteria but just separate them out from the rest of the bacteria or from the rest of the media where uh, the bacteria is present in or any microbe is present in so what's the difference between that uh, sterilization sterilization is an absolute condition where no microbe is left around to survive even the spores but disinfection is not so they cannot never be used as synonym, synonyms okay coming to the next slide now we talk about in case of controlling microorganisms we always use antibiotics so in case of uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis we have first line antibiotics and second line antibiotics so first line antibiotics i will talk about here is just an example is rifampicin Isonized, okay. Isonized ethambutol and pyrazinamide. So these are the first line drugs which are used for treatment of tuberculosis. 
Now, antibiotics means uh, any substance that is produced by one microbe and that can inhibit the inhibit or kill the other microbes. So the first antibiotic that was discovered by Alexander Fleming was penicillin. Was penicillin. And this played a very important role during World War VII because it it used to kill many of microbes used to many of the soldiers used to die because of the infection. So penicillin was a breakthrough. It was uh, isolated from a mold called as Penicillium notatum. So you can see here that notatum is a mold that is blocks to the fungi and is killing the bacteria. So one kind of microbe is inhibiting the other. That's what we antibiotics mean. Now we have another term here that is bacteriostasis. Bacteriostasis is a method of uh, which we can kill microorganisms. And Whereas uh, bacteriostasis, sorry, bacteriostasis, I will click it here, and sidel. There are two different uh, terms, bacteriostatic and bacteriocidal. So bacteriostasis is a condition where we can stop the multiplication of the microbes and without, uh, you know, killing them. So we can just uh, allow them to multiply for a certain period of time. And then if you remove uh, this uh, bacterial state uh, static agent they will start to multiply again but in case of bacteriocidal agents uh, they are the chemicals that can directly kill the microbes or they can inactivate uh, the bacteria for uh, some period of time so we can uh, do it by heat inactivation okay in case of vaccines we do it because either we uh, give uh, live vaccine vaccines to the uh, patients or we give killed or dead microbes to the for uh, vaccination so when you use live attenuated it means it's inactivated by heat okay and also we use the big uh, as a source of vaccine that are already killed so we have two kinds of vaccines live vaccines and kill vaccines there are other kinds also but I will not be discussing them here okay so any chemicals uh, based on their uh, bactericidal activity, their killing activity, we can name them uh, based on different spectrum of activity. If they are against bacteria, we call them as bactericidal. See, bactericidal is there. Again, virucidal, fungicidal against fungi. Microbicidal is a general term which can include all these three. Sporicidal, which can you know, destroy the spores, particularly uh, found by the gram-positive bacteria. Tuberculosidal, again, sidal is used, so it's uh, 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 killing the bacteria. So you can see that among them, uh, rifampicin is a tuberculosidal drug because it kills the mycobacterium tuberculosis. So instead of uh, INH and ethambutol, they are both bacteriostatic. So they can stop the multiplication. Bacteriostatic. Okay. So please bear with me, my handwriting is not clear here because I'm using the mouse. Okay. So, or we can use a germ, a degraded term for microbes is germ. So we can call them as germicidal also. Now we have a next term is decontamination. So you can see whatever, uh, whenever we work with microbiology, we are always suspicious, suspicion. We are always suspicion about contamination, right? So what is decontamination then? D means to remove that contamination. Or if you have uh, two uh, bacteria, if you have a single bacteria growing in a broth, so you uh, you consider that it, it is decon it's contaminated with other microbe. So it is, uh, you know, removing the contaminating pathogen from one single pathogen or one single uh, microorganism. So D in decontamination also, uh, we can, you know, articles can be uh, removed by either sterilization or disinfection. So decontamination, for example, when you want to, uh, you have finished your experiments, you have finished your diagnostics, then you want to, uh, you know, throw them away. So before throwing them away, you need to decontaminate them, decontaminate these microorganisms. Otherwise, they they can spread and infect other people also. Okay. So now again, you can see it uses two kinds of modes. It can use a physical mode as a chemical mode to remove or inactivate. It means killing it. Sorry, it means uh, keeping it alive but not allowing it to multiply. Remove means killing it, or you can say destroy it on the surfaces. So basically, these uh, you know decontaminants are used on the surface and uh, also for uh, you know removing your uh, all the microorganisms when you throw them out after your test is over. Okay, 
go to the next slide. So we have now uh, uh, something called as sanitization. So most probably after the COVID emergence of COVID uh, in Kashmir, we are using so much kind of sanitizers. So what is sanitization then? So sanitization is a way of, uh, you know, uh, it's a chemical way if you use, uh, like you are using ethanol based uh, sanitizers, they have 70% ethanol in them or you you are using isopropyl isopropyl alcohol isopropyl isopropyl alcohol propyl alcohol or you can use uh, chlorohexidine chl chlorohexidine so these kinds of uh, sanitizers are good because they contain alcohol and there are other clean uh, sanitization can also be achieved by other mechanical uh, cleaning for example, wiping and uh, you know rubbing the floors and other things, and it's very important in the public health sector, particularly in hospital settings. Okay, so uh, how is it achieved? Uh, it's it's particularly applicable in uh, food industry. It's uh, applicable in hospital settings because it reduces uh, the microbes on a preparatory benches where the food is being processed or prepared, uh, and and eating and the utensils that we use to you know eat them on. So, so that it will be acceptable for the public health. Otherwise, uh, you know, it can create a lot of problems for humans. Now, here we have the, another term called asepsis. So, asepsis is in, uh, you know, it's an environment. It's a microbe-free environment, and that can be achieved by different techniques. So, these techniques can be like using gloves, using uh, air filters. Particularly when you are working in the laminar airflow, you are using HEPA filters there. HEPA filters. There are special kind of haptos which filtrate your air when you are working in the laminar hood or your biosafety cabinet. And uh, we can also achieve by UV rays. You can, before you start working on the cabinet, you can put on the UV rays on. So UV uh, rays usually uh, are responsible for DNA damage of microbes. So when the DNA is damaged, they cannot multiply anymore. Okay. So another term we have here is antisepsis. So you might have heard about antiseptic creams. There are many antiseptic creams uh, which are used uh, around and they can be used for and applied for skin. They can be used for on the wounds and mucous membranes to remove the pathogenic microorganisms, but to some extent. So, okay, so it means that uh, they are not uh, bactericidal. So they are bacteriostatic. It means they can prevent the multiplication. Okay. So achieving this state is called antisepsis. Moving to the next slide. Now, because today we are concerned with sterilization and disinfection, you will see that sterilization and disinfection, as I told before, it's used in food industry and uh, you know in public health sector, in hospitals. But you also use it in uh, you know in theaters op or operation theaters, and you where you have to sterilize everything from the room up to all the equipments that need to be uh, used in the surgery. So we use that sterilization and disinfection. So if we divide it into uh, three groups, we will have one is the physical way of uh, destroying the microorganisms. Another is the chemical way of uh, killing them using different kinds of chemicals. Or, and the third process is physiochemical. It means it's a combination of physical and chemical mechanism. So we have these three ways of we can use in our operation theaters or in your uh, diagnostic laboratories or in your any uh, any place where uh, you know people come and go into the hospitals okay so now when you talk about physical uh, today i will be restricting my uh, lecture to the physical part and i will be only talking about this part okay so we'll go in detail about these so radiation filtration and chemical methods and physiochemical methods we'll be talking in the next lecture so in this lecture you will only be having uh, sunlight heat and vibration and we'll discuss them one by one in minute details okay let's move to the next slide so as we have seen we will talk we'll be talking about the sunlight we'll be talking about we'll, we'll be talking about the uh, heat and heat can be divided into two forms either it is a dry heat or it is a moist heat, heat with a moisture around. Third way of doing it is vibration. We use different kinds of ultrasonic machines where we can, you know, 
try to uh, kill the microorganisms these two i mean radiation and filtration i will not be talking in this lecture they will be a part of the second part of the upcoming lecture okay move to the next slide so let us talk about the sunlight first so when you talk about sunlight uh, we have something called as ozone layer in our atmosphere so when the sun starts to produce different kinds of rays among them one of the rays is the ultraviolet ray okay and most of the people uh, particularly in the European countries they like to have a sun bath on the beaches so it used to cause this uh, UV can produce produce a skin myeloma that's one type of cancer of the skin okay so if you if it is uh, you know having effect on our, our cells definitely uh, UV light will also have some effect on the microbes so the microbial activity again I'm using the term sidel it means it's killing or it's sterilizing the microbes so it is uh, this activity is mainly due to the presence of the ultraviolet rays in your sunlight so although ozone layer can you know stop some of it but as the pollution is coming up the ozone layer is getting thinner and thinner and more of the ultraviolet light is coming to the earth so if you use this uh, if you use the artificial ultraviolet tube so it's available in the market we use it in our hood so whenever we have to work in a biosafety cabinet we have to switch it on for around say 15 minutes and after that we can start work because this what will it do it will sterilize our bench it will sterilize our uh, you know working place where it will be in a cabinet so if this is the surface of the cabinet we, it is the tube is here so the light comes on this and it sterilizes the whole of the cabinet so we do it before working on the cabinet okay so what are the different features of it it is a spontaneous way of uh, sterilizing uh, and it is natural also and in tropical countries you know uh, where uh, where there is more uh, uh, sun is more available and more kind of heat is coming so in this case um, uh, the bactericidal activity of uh, sunlight uh, will be a combination of uv plus heat okay so sunlight provides uh, as i mentioned before it is a natural method of disinfection it's also used in uh, naturally it uh, you know disinfects the water bodies like uh, tanks and lakes by killing the bacteria in the uh, water so you can see here I'm using the term killing killing means siddle this killing is also alternative called as siddle so but in case of uh, spores uh, it is not able to you know remove the spores most of the gram positive bacteria which are causing patho which are pathogenic and cause human diseases you know uh, sunlight cannot help in that so what options do we have the next one okay now the next option that we have is heat so heat as you say it's present in the sun also but now here we are using heat in an artificial way okay so we have we have different kinds of machines where we can generate heat to sterilize our uh, different kinds of uh, either media where you culture the microbes or any kind of any equipment you or glass glass where you want to sterilize we can use heat in artificial way now okay so when you talk about heat now talk about heat so it is considered as the most reliable method of sterilizing of articles and those articles only which can withstand the heat so the examples can be one of the examples can be glassware so how does the heat you know destroy the microorganisms the heat can destroy microorganisms by different ways one is oxidative stress it means uh, if you have hydrogen peroxide is particularly present in your cells so because of the heat you know they can uh, produce uh, superoxide anions okay uh, it can produce different kinds of uh, 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 you know free radicals and these free radicals can uh, destroy can destroy you know your dna and destroying the dna means the micro will not be able to multiply and it means if it's not able to multiply then finally it is to killing when you keep it give it a more longer exposure okay so it also uh, kills the bacteria by denaturation so many proteins that are present on the cell wall of microbes or uh, inside the uh, microbes they get denatured means they have a three-dimensional structure so any enzyme can only work when it has a proper three-dimensional structure 
but uh, with the heat it denatures it it means it loses its uh, normal uh, structure and it becomes non-functional so if it's non-functional though so the cell dies with that the third way it can uh, you know kill the microbiome is coagulation so whatever uh, unfolded proteins are there they can combine together and you know they can form some form of uh, uh, you know some form of uh, they can mix with each other and this process is coagulation so coagulation you will, uh, you will recall that in blood uh, when uh, when some we get injured then coagulation takes place because the platelets you know platelets can combine and form a mesh like structure uh, providing us to lose our blood the same same case the coagulation of protein takes place they form a mesh like structure and become non functional so those articles that cannot withstand the high heat so what what is the option for it uh, that cannot you know tolerate the high temperatures so we can do we can we can lower the temperature to sterilize the articles uh, by prolonging the duration of the exposure so if you can go down to the temperature you can uh, then you have to increase the time or prolong the duration time when it's exposed there are uh, different factors now which can you know affect uh, the sterilization by heat so one of them is nature of the heat uh, we have two kinds of heats one is uh, moist heat and another is dry heat so in this case uh, it is the uh, dry heat sorry moist heat that is more effective than the uh, dry heat another important factor is temperature in the time so here you should remember that uh, for any kind of uh, sterilization the temperature is uh, the temperature is inversely proportional to the time you had to spend on or you had to spend the article for the exposure so if you are increasing the temperature then uh, you know uh, in a very less time in a very less time uh, you will get uh, achieve sterilization but if you are decreasing the temperature for example then you have to increase the time duration for which it, you are exposing it to so this relationship is inverse inverse so you should understand that so as we increase the temperature the time taken for sterilization decreases okay so when it increases when this part increases this part i mean time decreases okay we'll be seeing it in following slides another factor that, that is uh, responsible for uh, affecting or you know uh, affecting the heat uh, sterilization is the number of microorganisms more will be the microorganisms more time it will take uh, for the heat to you know to destroy them mm, at all so then another is the nature of the microorganism different microorganisms you know based on the their structures and uh, they can you know uh, they can give different they can they, become, they can become they can give different uh, response uh, to the heat so it depends upon the species for example for mycobacterium tuberculosis you, know, you when you use myco myco means fungo fungi and tuber means it's a uh, so myco means fungi and tuber means bacteria so it has a fungi like structure it means uh, is this bacteria is very difficult uh, to get you know sterilized because of its uh, many kinds of lipids present in the cell wall particularly mycolic acid and then it has the ability of uh, bacteria so it, it, it combines the pathogenicity so in these cases we have to see what kind of species and strain we use so when i was working with microbacteria we used to sterilize it only one way that is a moist heat using autoclave so this autoclave we'll be talking about in the coming slides okay and now action of uh, spores action against the spores so spores are highly resistant to heat it means when you try to heat something and you want to eliminate the uh, spores you cannot so you cannot achieve sterilization in this case now uh, based on the type of the material now you are uh, trying to you know uh, uh, decontaminate by heat you can you heavily contaminated uh, material requires very high temperature and also you have to prolong the exposure so you, here you will see that uh, you need both the high temperature and prolong the time the more time you spend on it so here it, the uh, relationship is not inverse okay otherwise temperature is inversely proportional to the time duration which is supposed to be exposed to the micro so when you have something that is heavily contaminated you need to increase the temperature also and you used to give it more time uh, to the exposure 
so it is uh, for, for those uh, conditions where the contamination is very heavy otherwise in other cases you have to uh, follow this formula okay we will be discussing it soon then about the heat sensitive uh, some uh, articles are not sensitive to the heat or so they have to be sterilized at lower temperature in this case uh, you cannot achieve sterilization until you do not give it more time of exposure so this formula works here okay and uh, presence of organic materials so there are some things which are present in the bacterial viruses that takes uh, you know makes us uh, it takes makes us make them more you know uh, heat liable for example uh, some kinds for like some heat shock proteins are there so if they are there it becomes very difficult for the heat uh, to you know uh, finish the bacteria up. then there are different kinds of oligosaccharides polysaccharides present in the bacteria that can also make uh, heat you know for difficult uh, for destroying the micron then there are oils we cannot use oil against the we cannot use heat for uh, removing the oils microorganisms that are present in the oils or microorganisms that are present in the fats okay moving to the next slide now action of the heat how does heat kill we have already uh, just given you a basic idea about it so what does it do it denatures the protein it provides oxidative stress to the micro which causes DNA damage and DNA damage can cause the kill okay then it also has uh, the toxic effects of elevated levels of the electrolytes normally if you talk about electrolytes present in human the most uh, common is NaCl okay so there are different kinds of electrolytes that can uh, you know when they go increase in the level they can have toxic effect on the micro because more uh, kind of electro when uh, they uh, they can you know elevate more so what will happen is uh, osmotic lesses can take place so because bacteria is if this, this is a bacteria and this is your environment okay so uh, come so if the electrolytes increase in this place so what water is going to get inside the bacteria penetrate the bacteria and cause the lysis of the bacteria so this is how the increased concentration of electrolytes can cause uh, lysis and death of the microorganism it means killing now moist heat also works by the same way it, uh, it denatures uh, the protein it coagulates the protein but uh, in case of dry heat you will find that mo uh, moist heat is more superior to the dry heat because uh, in this case uh, it can also kill the spores so now, now temperature you, uh, you know uh, that's uh, required to kill microbe by dry heat you need more temperature as compared to the moist heat so moist heat we will be discussing shortly so but in dry heat we have to use very high temperatures and we can what we can achieve in very less temperatures in the moist heat so this is called uh, this uh, formula that's called thermal death time so this is the, i mean the temperature is inversely proportional to your time so this is called thermal death time okay so either when you increase the temperature you can denature or you can sterilize your product or article in very less time okay in a particular specified environment now coming to the heat now we have two kinds of heat as we discussed so in first we'll discuss about the dry heat and then we'll be discussing about the moist heat so how can we achieve dry heat uh, in, in an artificial way so for that we had different ways of uh, different techniques we are using different kinds of instruments so one of them is a uh, red heat and framing so you will you can get both by using the bunsen burner so red heat means you will keep the article un until it becomes red hot and flaming means when you have any uh, liquid media you can just you know bring it close and then remove bring it close and then remove bring it close and then remove so it is called flaming so let us see what are kinds of articles can be used uh, you know can be decontaminated by red heat and flaming so articles such as bacteriological loops which we use for inoculation uh, wires uh, tips forceps and syringes uh, spatulas they can uh, be sterilized by holding them in the person until they become red hot okay uh, it's a simple method of uh, effective uh, sterilization of articles but it is limited to the articles uh, you know that cannot be uh, uh, flamed to the redness so in this case we use uh, flaming so flaming is you bring the article near to the flame 
and just remove it again bring it again near to the frame just remove it again so whenever you are opening or closing your media liquid media so you need to do flaming instead of red heat red heat can be used when you're inoculating a bacteria from one plate to another okay so this method uh, again I, as i told you it's using the burn cell family but it does not make it to go red hot so what kind of articles can be sterilized by framing so it can be scalpels which are used uh, mostly in uh, removing the tissues it can be uh, used for uh, the mouth of the tubes opening and closing it can be used for flasks it can be used for glass slides particularly when we do sudden staining we do flaming of uh, flame we do flaming for some period so that or uh, you know our uh, uh, the sputum of uh, the sputum of the patient becomes dry we can leave it air dry also but uh, in some other options we can flame it and then start staining it it is also used for uh, cover silps and uh, and this flaming has to be done a few times as compared to the dry heat you have to keep it there and let it heat over and then you can use okay now even though most vegetative cells i mean uh, the cells without the spores they are killed but there's no guarantee that it kills the spores so two it will be too short uh, to die it, it, it will be a too short exposure for the spores so this method too is limited to the articles that can be exposed to flame as crackling of uh, you know cracking or crackling of glassware can take place so what are the other options we have let's move to the next option so the next options we have is incineration incineration the term itself is very easy to understand as i have pictured it for incineration means just burning out so whatever uh, material you are using in your uh, you are in your lab when one is testing is done and everything is done you need to throw it away but you cannot throw it away just like that okay so you have particularly three kinds of bags you can throw them in you have the red bag you have the blue bag and you have the yellow bag so this is the yellow one this is the blue one and this is the red one in red uh, pl plastic bag you have to put all the materials which are infectious okay all the materials that are infectious in blue bag you can put once it's uh, autoclaved in blue bag you can put the uh, uh, sharp you can put the sharp kinds of uh, you know uh, sharp kinds of uh, scalpels or whatever you have syringes you have to put it in the blue bag and finally whatever is in the uh, whatever comes from the kitchen it has to be thrown in the yellow bag so we, when we are already you know first we uh, you know sort it out right here and then in this red bag you need to insert it i mean to burn it so why you need to burn it because uh, after, even after before you can uh, take this red bag you need to autoclave it first so autoclaving will be the first process autoclave autoclave it is if it is very infectious like uh, if you are taking testing uh, the covid patients or if you are taking uh, testing uh, you know uh, uh, tb patients so you need to follow this process of insulation but this is followed by three steps first the you know uh, making them throw in the different bags and this red bag then it has to be uh, go through the autoclave and after autoclave you can burn it you can incinerate it and then you can uh, dig a hole in the earth and put this incineration all is happening here but what's the side effect here you can see that a lot of smoke is coming out of the incineration that can you know uh, have an uh, environmental effect but there's no option for us so what kinds of articles we can you know use for insulation is the soil dressing when you change the dressing of the patient any animal carcasses uh, pathological materials uh, for example biopsies if you have taken biopsy and you have completed all the reports on it so you have to throw it in the red bag and then autoclave it and then insert it you can also use a bedding of the patients uh, who are you know suffering from covid right now because this is the only way of eliminating the virus right now so they should be subjected to insertion so this technique results in uh, the loss of the article of course we don't need them anymore so it is being destroyed and hence is suitable only for those articles that need to be disposed of so we don't insert you know uh, things that we have to reuse again so uh, but one problem is there that if you are burning polystyrene because many many of the test tubes or uh, you know plastic test tubes are made up of polystyrene it emits a dense smoke 
and hence should not be used for incineration. You can see the, the, the smoke is not here, it's too dark because we are only incinerating the other particles but not polystyrene. So you have to keep this in mind. Okay. Now, what are the other ways? Another artificial way of using heat and sterilizing over things is hot air oven. You might have seen it in your labs. So it, it's a simple structure uh, that you that is present on your shelves, and um, then it has tray different trays on uh, on this area, and you can place your material on these trays, and you can just then uh, close the lid off for some particular period of time, and you can regulate the temperature here. So once the temperature is is has reached and the time you have set for has reached, it will beep out that the sterilization has completed. So you can then open the door and take your materials, but be careful of uh, not taking it directly. Let them cool first and then you can use some gloves to take them off. So hot air ovens, uh, it was uh, you know uh, introduced by Louis Pasteur and he is well known as the father of microbiology and well known for kind of make, uh, you know uh, discovering many kinds of or making inventing many kinds of vaccines for uh, many types of uh, things okay so uh, articles to be sterilized are uh, you know exposed to very high temperature that is at 100 degrees celsius if it is a liquid it starts to boil, boil but if it's not liquid if it's a glassware or something other, other things this temperature is okay for them and duration you have to use it for one hour so what you can do is you can set the timing and you can set the temperature once it reaches the 160 it will uh, remain there for uh, an hour and then it works and your uh, you know any object that is sterilized and this heating is coming from the heat electricity so you have to plug it in into the uh, your uh, your lab lab plug in so you have to it will be a wire there you will plug it in and, and this electricity will you know generate the heat inside this because of the different kinds of coils present in it so but uh, air is poor conductor of since air is poor conductor of heat so we need even distribution of heat because uh, and you should keep the load low here so uh, for even distribution of the heat and this is achieved by a fan so this fan can you know distribute uh, the heat evenly in all the chambers in all the trays and help you in decontaminating your product. So, the heat is transferred to the article by three different ways. It is the even as uh, read it in thermodynamics. Thermodynamics. You might have read it already in your eleventh uh, and twelfth class in physics. So, heat is particularly transferred by radiation, conduction, and convection. So, the oven should be fitted with the uh, as I told you, it's a thermostat control. It has a temperature indicator and meshed, uh, meshed uh, shells. Meshed means they have a small, uh, you know, uh, uh, small openings so that the air can pass through them. Okay, so that it get all uh, the heat is, uh, you know, distributed evenly. So, what kind of articles can be sterilized using hot air oven? We can use uh, sterilized metallic instruments like your forceps your scalpels, your scissors, your glassware that contains, uh, you know, petri dishes, pipettes, flasks, and all kinds of glass syringes. You can uh, use it for, uh, you know, uh, sterilizing your swabs, oils. So as I told you, in wet uh, heat, you cannot sterilize oils. So in this case, we can sterilize it in a hot air oven. Uh, grease, petroleum jelly, and some other, some uh, pharmaceutical products. Okay. So let's move to the next slide now. Now, uh, when you talk about hot air oven, there are many things that need to be taken care of. And uh, this cycle and process, uh, you will see how does it happen as I told you in the beginning. So let us see uh, the process first and then we will be talking about its cycle. So the articles to be sterilized must be preferably dry. So you don't need to keep them wet. You can just dry them out, so let them air dry and then place them inside the to avoid any breakages because of the upcoming heat. So articles may be uh, placed at a sufficient distance so that the free circulation takes place as I told in, uh, earlier. And uh, the mouth of the flask and the test tubes or uh, pipettes, you, you need to plug them up with the cotton wool or you can plug them up uh, with other uh, things. Uh, articles such as petri dishes and any petri plates on which you, you know, the petri plate looks like this. So you are culturing anything 
on the surface of the battery plates and here is your solid media on that you can culture things so and pipettes they can be arranged uh, inside a metal canister first so you will have a metal canister you can arrange these uh, battery plates like here like this in a, and then you can close the canister up and put it inside the hot air oven so it should be a metal canister so that heat can you know reach to the inside the battery plates and then uh, place it so we will we use this either when we are trying to grow some microorganisms or when we have to decontaminate something I mean sterilize something so individual glass articles must be wrapped either in a craft paper or you can use aluminum foils you know you can use aluminum foils to use of the open jars for example if you have put uh, some small tubes here like uh, one or two ml small tubes that need to be you know uh, sterilized you can put them inside and then you can cover them up with the aluminum foil now talking about the sterilization cycle so this takes into consideration two things one is the time taken for the article to reach the sterilizing temperature maintain it for a particular time of period that is say about, uh, around um, r and uh, then for it so this uh, process is called holding time holding time is you have to keep the time uh, i mean you have to keep the temperature for this particular uh, time maybe for one hour so then you have to allow it to cool down so one is called cool down different uh, temperature uh, time relations can happen here so here you will understand this formula so temperature is inversely proportional to time uh, time exposure so here see different time relations can be there either you can hold it of at a temperature of 160 degree for one hour if you want to hold it for only 40 minutes then you have to increase the temperature okay if you want to further you want to get your items quickly out of your uh, hot air oven you can decrease the time you can you can uh, complete the whole process in just 20 minutes but you have to increase the temperature so at 20 as you decrease the temperature yeah, as you decrease the uh, time so then you have to give a more uh, if you decrease sorry if you decrease the time then you have to give an exposure of much higher temperature that is 180 degrees Celsius so in short I can say that increasing the temperature by 10 degrees it can shorten the sterilization time by 50 percent so remember this relationship coming to the next part is now what are the controls that you can put in your uh, hot air oven it means that how, how will you be sure that my my articles are fully sterilized they don't uh, they are not uh, contaminated by anything else so you should you, you need to have a controls for that so three methods exist to check the sterilization efficiency and these are physical chemical and biological physical is you need a temperature uh, chart recorder as well as a thermocouple you need for chemical you can put a brownie tube number three it has a green spot if it is completely sterilized uh, the red spot on its surface will turn into the green spot so why that's why it's called green spot biological way is that you need to put the spores in the range of 10 to 6 that spores can be of uh, bacillus subtilis van niger or clostridium titani you can use such kinds or you can use clostridium titani on a paper strip so for example you have a paper strip here and you have your clostridium titani here are placed inside the envelopes and then placed inside the hot air oven so what will what do you expect what will happen to them so you you should expect that this number should decrease so if it is one million times for six times for million so it should go down to times for say four then go down to times for two then go to, uh, to times for one so times for one is ten itself then uh, times for zero log of times for zero is one and then it should completely get sterilized so it should there should be no microorganism present or spores should be present on the surface okay so this is how the biological way of uh, this works so upon completion of the sterilizing cycle the strips are removed and they can you know incubated in thioglycolate broth or cooked meat medium when you incubate them for three to five days there should be no growth okay so proper sterilization should it means it should kill the spores and then there should be not any growth on your plates so this is the way how we use the control to you know uh, to confirm that your sterilization has taken place okay now there are some advantages for it and there are disadvantages so what are the advantages in hot air oven is it, it is it is an 
in this particularly efficient method of sterilization only for heat stable articles second is it is uh, only way it's the only method by which you can sterilize oils and powders we have talked about oils in the previous slide now there are some every method you know they have the advantages and disadvantages so we have to see we have to make a balance out of it and see uh, whether it is sometimes we can you adjust the disadvantages in order to achieve uh, your desired um, you know sterilization so since uh, air is a poor conductor of heat hot air has you know poor penetration it does not penetrate uh, properly as contrast to the moist heat it has the penetrating power so here hot air own is giving us dry heat okay so sometimes what will happen that when you plug uh, your uh, you know glass uh, your know, glassware or paper it may get uh, burned or charred out uh, glasses can become smoky and it takes a longer time compared to the autoclave so autoclave uses moist heat and it's more effective way of uh, sand i mean uh, you know, sterilization particularly it can also penetrate your spores okay next next way of uh, an, uh, using an uh, artificial uh, heating um, is using the infrared rays so when you look on the spectrum you you know about the uh, wick coil formula v i b g y o r so what you see here is on the left side of it the frequency is more okay but as we move on you can see the wavelength increases so in this case on the left side of the uh, wave square we have more energetic radiations energetic radiations and one of them as you move towards the left of this wave square leave the visible spectrum you will find you have infrared spectrum in this case there is more frequency it is more energetic so when you talk about microwaves now they don't use micro uh, waves microwaves uh, microwave oven everybody has it in their home to cook some things very fast so it uses uh, infrared radiation also in your when you are pressing something you have you have, uh, you have your uh, electric machine pressing machine so it also uses it also uses uh, i mean infrared radiations okay to heat up and then you can press your clothes okay so infrared rays bring about sterilization by generating heat obviously in case of microwaves and your electric iron articles uh, to be sterilized are placed in a moving uh, conveyor belt this is the uh, sophisticated uh, infrared machine so you put some things inside and inside it has a conveyor belt and has to pass through that tunnel and that is heated by infrared radiations so uh, if if you uh, open up this box you will see that you have this conveyor belt okay you have put your article on the surface so as the conveyor belt moves forward here is a lamp it showers infrared radiations on it and this gets sterilized and then it comes out of the machine okay here the temperature is very high see well, lastly we have seen the temperature was around 160 we are again using a very high temperature here that's 180 much much higher than the boiling uh, point boiling point of water but here we are not using the water i'm just giving an example a synonym the articles are exposed to the temperature for a period of uh, means 7.5 minutes so time period is very less because you have used very high temperature that's why one defines your inverse relationship article sterilized include the, includes the medical instruments the glassware you can put them in and uh, it is mostly uh, you know uh, used in the central supply of any department mm -hmm. so it requires special equipment so you are not you will not find it in your diagnostic labs but you will get if you want to sterilize water or something else you can go to this department and anything you want uh, to get sterilized you can uh, you go to the department and make it done because it will not be present in your uh, diagnostic laboratory so efficiency can be checked by using a brownie tube for it uses a blue, blue spot okay now coming to the next slide we are coming now to the moist heat so what is moist heat and what is the difference between moist heat and dry heat moist heat just uses the moisture in uh, in the air see uh, uh, in dry heat also there is moisture and uh, when you try to put something inside a closed uh, tube you will find that the air is not there now so the moisture of the air goes down 
So, but if you definitely want to, you know, uh, sterilize something and you have an ability or you have some equipment that you can let the moisture go in, okay. And moisture will all, only be produced when you have some equipment here that can, you have water here, it can boil, it can become a steam and then you can allow it into the inner chamber while you have placed your equipment so it will be sterilized. So we'll be uh, shortly looking about it in much detail. So there are three uh, temperatures at which you can use uh, moist heat. One is uh, below 100 degrees Celsius. Okay. Another is at 100 degrees Celsius. And the third one is, this is the first one, this is the second one. So you can use the moist heat at different temperatures. And the third one is above 100 degrees Celsius. So let us talk them, discuss them one by one. Here we are talking about the first one. Okay, moist heat acts again, you, you know, it's acting by coagulation, you might have heard about coagulation of blood when platelets accumulate by denaturation, losing the proteins, the erogenous structure. So this moist heat, or you can say blue 100 degrees Celsius, but less than 100 degrees Celsius temperature, it was used by pasture and that developed a technique called as pasteurization. So again, Lewis Pasture, rightly called as the father of microbiology, is responsible for this technique. So now it's originally being uh, it, was, it was employed by Lewis Pasture. So currently it's employed in food and dairy industry. But if you remember that it can also be used in your uh, medical uh, settings. So there are two methods of pasteurization. One is the Holder method, and another is the Flash method. See what is the difference between the two? It's very simple. Holder method is you have to hold it at this temperature, 60, 63 degrees Celsius for 30 minutes. Okay, this is a holding method. Another is flash method. So see, if I increase the temperature from 63 to 72, it means it's around uh, 9, 7, 8, 9, yes, 9 degrees higher than the 63. Okay, so I'm increasing the temperature by 9 degrees and then you will see I can get the sterilization done in less than, in 15 minutes, that is half of the 30. Okay. And then important thing uh, to remember about pasteurization is when which, mo which most of the students uh, fail to you know uh, recognize or uh, they forget it is immediately after this is done we had to cool uh, whatever thing is there make it reach the 13 degrees Celsius. So pasteurization means heating followed by immediate cooling. That is what that is what kills most of the bacteria present in the food and our dairy products like milk, milk curd, and other things. Okay, so other uh, pasteurization methods which are now you know uh, improving with technology is the high ultra high temperature. So here you will see temperature we have from 63 to 72. It's almost double to the 72. Okay, so temperature is almost double, and this time is kept uh, at the same. Okay, for 15 seconds or even if you increase it further, you will say in half a second your sterilization is done. So most of the dairy industry, uh, you know, they now do this uh, to immediately uh, finish their sterilization. So this uh, ultra high temperature uh, technology or you can say pasteurization, it is suitable to destroy most of the milk borne pathogens which are present in our milk. For example, salmonella which can, typhi can cause typhoid. Okay, mycobacterium tuberculosis can cause TB. Then we have streptococci. Cocci means circular, and then they are in a straight line. We also have staph. Cocci staph means like this, in a bunch of grapes. So staph Staphylococcus, uh, which is now responsible for MRSA, methylene uh, MRSA methylene resistant Staphylococcus aureus which can cause many problems in our wounds and brucella but exception is uh, coxelia may survive the pasteurization this is one of the bacteria which is not you know it cannot be sterilized by pasteurization so then you have to find some other way 
Now efficiency is tested by different things. As I told, we need control to so test our efficiency of our uh, techniques we use. So they use two techniques here, phosphate ACE test and methylene blue test. I will not be going in details. So let's move to the next. Another way of uh, you know getting an artificial heat uh, in your lab, laboratory or diagnostic laboratory is using a hot water bath. So in hot water bath, we have different kinds of baths. You can, if you are in the vaccine industry, you will use vaccine bath. And if you have to, you, if we, if we are, if we need some serum, and we need to get rid of the other contaminants, we use a serum uh, bath. Uh, serum is particularly you can understand that when uh, COVID-19 emerged, we are trying to get an, uh, we are going to. Uh, you know, we are trying to get a vaccine, but you know, many of the places uh, the serum technique has been used where the patients who have got uh, recovered, the serum is isolated from them and then it needs to be, uh, you know, uh, cleared up. It needs to be sterilized means uh, organisms, if there are any microorganisms, we need to remove them before we can use them to the patient. So, uh, this serum definitely contains antibodies against the coronavirus so if we can if we can avail these antibodies and put it in the other patient uh, it can work but in uh, many cases it has worked but in other cases uh, it has completely you know led to the death also because our immune system can immediately uh, reject these antibodies and uh, these antibodies that are directed to this kind of antibodies they can destroy our own cells okay so we have to be very careful about this so now this serum uh, uh, you know uh, way of uh, clearing it is uh, not good. Now, in vaccine bath, uh, the contaminated bacteria which has present, which are present in the vaccine preparation, we can inactivate them. Inactivate means uh, we can kill them or sterilize them by heating uh, in a water bath and maintain a temperature of uh, 60 degrees for an hour. So only vegetative cells, means cells which are uh, not covered by spores, can uh, be killed, but spores survive. Okay. In the serum bath, the contaminating bacteria in the serum preparations, as I told you, we can inactivate it by heating the water bath at a lesser temperature, that is 56, 4 degrees less than the vaccine bath. Again, the temperature is same, one hour is here, one hour is here. Okay, but then a different thing here is that we have to do it on successive days, you know, you can do it for one hour on the first day, then second day, then third day, fourth day. So it becomes, as you increase more exposure, so less chances of contamination. So again, uh, this hot water will uh, work by, you know, coagulating your proteins at high temperature. But um, as far as the vegetative cells are concerned, they will get, we will get rid of them, but the spores are still surviving. Okay. So this is a simple diagram of uh, uh, your water bath. So it has a, a heated coil inside and you, the water is inside this. Is then you plug it inside your socket. Again, electricity, you know, tries to uh, boil the water. In the boiling water, you can put uh, these things and see. But uh, boiling only occurs at 100 degrees Celsius. So uh, we are trying to keep it below 100 so that the water doesn't boil. So it, it, it gives us a, a, you know, a warm, warm feeling when you dip your hand inside. Okay. Okay. Move to the next slide. Another way of uh, using uh, heat artificially is the process of is the process called as in inspissation. So inspissation is technique. It's a technique to solidify as well as disinfect either eggs or serum containing media. So when you look at this inspissation, you will see that this is the instrument here, and in this instrument you will find that uh, there are uh, slanting uh, you know rows, and on that you put your slides up. So what happens when you put it on the slanting form, the the, uh, the liquid immediately tries to solidify because of the heat. That's called inspissation. In, in so the medium containing these uh, egg or you know serum, they are put in a slope of an uh, inspector as you can see it here. Okay, and the temperature here is used higher than what we use in uh, water bath. It is 80 to 85. In water bath, we you are supposed to use 60 degree. So here, that there we were used to keep for one hour. Here we need to, need to keep it on for only 30 minutes. And again, for successive days, one, two, three, four, same technique, same temperature for successive days. So on the first day, what happens is day one. So the vegetative bacteria are killed. Okay. 
and the spores start to germinate. The next day, it means day two, spores start to germinate. So what is spore germination? Spore germination is, for example, if a bacteria is covered by a spores, a spore cover. So if it starts to germinate, germination means the spore, uh, you know, tries to uh, give away for the bacteria to come out. So the bacteria is now spore free. So this is called germination when the spores break down and the outer covering of the spore breaks. Okay. This being said, uh, the spores are germinated and they are killed on the next day. I mean day two. The, the process depends on germination of spores and in between in, in uh, in between the time we use for inspiration, for example, uh, one day, second day, and third day. So if, uh, if the spore fails to germinate, then no sterilization can take place by this by inspiration technique. So it needs uh, the spore to gen germinate. And one way for allowing the spore to germinate is to provide it uh, moist heat. So moist heat can penetrate the spores as compared to the, uh, compared to the dry heat. So once, it's, once the moisture goes in, then the spores can brush out. The spore can brush and then the bacteria is released out and then it can be easily killed. So it's as if uh, we are, you know, taking out the tracking, taking out the coating of someone. Uh, for example, say uh, military people, we are taking out all their defenses out and then we will be able to simply kill them. Okay. So this is just an analogy. Okay. Moving to the next slide. So now we are talking about moist heat at 100 degrees Celsius. And definitely you will be able to understand it. At 100 degrees Celsius, the water starts to boil up. So we are here again, this instrument, just like your water bath, but we can increase the temperature to 100 degrees. So the water inside it starts to boil. Okay, so boiling definitely happens at handling, it kills, it means it is bacteria, stereocidal, it kills the vegetative cells and bacteria and the viruses. So it's effective for both the viruses and the bacteria, I mean boiling at 100 degrees Celsius. And they will be killed immediately. Now, some bacterial spores are resistant to boiling and survive. And hence this is not a suitable method uh, for you know sterilizing the spores if you are you know uh, if you are as, uh, expecting the spores are present in your uh, material in your liquid broth and uh, certain toxins bacterial toxins particularly uh, staphylococcus enterotoxin so we have two kinds of uh, toxins one is uh, endotoxin endotoxins we have exotoxins exotoxins and we have enterotoxins so what is the difference between the three endotoxin first example in bacteria is lipopolysaccharide so it is a part of the bacteria okay it is a part of the bacterial me outer membrane so sometimes it gets away it, uh, it gets away from uh, the bacterial cell wall and it becomes an exotoxin endotoxin so it's an endotoxin because it's present uh, in, in, in an inner membrane of the bacteria but once the breakdown takes place it can come out and acts as an immunogen and then it's exotoxins exotoxins the bacteria has produced its toxins inside and then it spits them out so these toxins can create a problem then so this is an endotoxin because it's a part of the bacteria it does is not secreted out but the bacteria when it breaks down it releases it so exotoxins are which are produced inside the bacteria and release and uh, these are these are a subgroup of uh, exotoxins that is enterotoxins so certain bacterials are uh, resistant to this for example this enterotoxin of staphylococcus so uh, the boiling technique may not work for it okay the killing activity is enhanced by addition of 2% uh, sodium bicarbonate okay it can help in uh, enhancing the killing activity uh, when absolute certainty is not required, for example, if you are just if you just want to get your uh, you know you don't want a completely sterile uh, you, you know you just want to get uh, your media or some article metallic articles and glassware you can use them for it when your complete sterilization is not required as case of the 
in, in pasteurization we need complete sterilization in liquid broths we need a complete sterilization in uh, uh, you know uh, when you are preparing uh, plates uh, agar plates blood uh, agar that time also you need complete sterilization but when it's not required we just want to you know just uh, kill some of the bacteria and so we can boil them for 10 to 20 minutes to disinfect them the lid of the boiler must not be opened during that period because you will see that the, when it's boiling the steam will go out okay so you should come keep it the lid come closed here okay now steaming steaming can also be done at the same temperature water boils and we allow that uh, steam if we allow that steam to accumulate somewhere we can once the water starts to boil so let us say that we have this water bath and uh, the water is boiling over here it's producing the uh, steam we are using this uh, steam and we are concentrating it in a particular equipment and then we flash that steam onto the articles so instead of keeping the articles in boiling water we can do it one way dip it in there in case of the boiling process or we, we don't need to dip them up if they are water you know susceptible they can they, they can be damaged with water we can do steaming process so they are subjected to free steam at 100 degrees celsius so traditionally uh, this ornals and Koch steamer were used this is one uh, structure of them and uh, the object is not put inside uh, the water but it's kept uh, at a shelf over here so because the steam cannot escape so it starts working on the things which are placed above the water so what is a steamer it is a met metallic cabinet which has perforated trays so that the uh, you know boiling perforated tray means it has small holes and the steam can get out and then work on the articles to hold the article and uh, it has a conical lid on the top of it just like an autoclave and uh, with a discharge tap on can also serve at the same purpose so the bottom of the steamer is filled with the water and heated up to 100 degrees celsius the steam thus generated can sterilize the articles when exposed around for 90 minutes again you see in different procedures different kinds of uh, temperatures and different kinds of uh, time periods are required so you should understand them very well and um, you should you should remember uh, them well so you need to remember temperatures and you need to remember the time periods for different techniques that are used in sterilizing either by dry heat or moist heat so you can do this for the media for example uh, tcba dca media you can use it for selenide broth so you don't, you don't need to put the broth inside the water because it will get mixed with the water so we can, we can keep it above that and then use the steam for sterilization okay another uh, way of uh, using uh, the artificial dry heat is tantalization so what is tantalization it's named after a person who discovered uh, this process by john tendal it's also called as fractionation or uh, intermittent sterilization it means you sterilize it wait for a moment and do it again in, do uh, sterilize it wait time and go do it again so the free steaming is done for uh, only 20 minutes and again successive days one two three four and go on so particularly sugars and gelatin that are present in different kinds of media they are exposed to this tantalization process because uh, if you put them in autoclave or if you put them in the boiling water or, or if you put them in the steamer they can decompose okay so the vegetative bacteria are killed definitely but in the first exposure of uh, first day and the spores that germinate only the spores that are able to germinate can be killed in the, the, the next day so you can see that spore uh, killing can occur place uh, by the process of tantalization and uh, by the previous uh, what we previously talked about i mean uh, the last technique we used then the success of the protein uh, i mean the success of this pro process it depends upon the germination of spores again if, if the spores do not germinate and then and this uh, tantalization effect cannot take place so this was a uh, simple uh, way of uh, using tantalization which was this was developed by tendal stuff so you can see the complexity of how many things are there put into the place now but we can have uh, you know developed with the technology we can put it in one cabin and do all the process in that so but imagine how hard working this uh, means these previous scientists were because they had to develop the technique themselves and then they had to see the effects 
today with the developers are uh, different, the manufacturers are different, and workers are different, the technicians are different, and researchers are different. So see how much hard work uh, these people have been putting in. Okay, going to the next slide is now we are using about using talking about the moist heat, and we are using the moist heat at now at above 100 degrees Celsius. So we have used it before in the previous slides below 100 degree where we included pasteurization then we kept it at 100 degrees celsius at that time we used boiling and tantalization and now we are increasing the temperature to above uh, 100 degrees celsius so this gave out a way for the invention of autoclave which is present in most of the microbiological labs and either if you are in the hospital settings if you are working in the uh, research area of microbiology if you are uh, working in a diagnostic la lab of uh, microbiology okay so you will find the autoclave there so we have many different kinds of autoclaves some are patch top and some are very big they need to get fixed in the wall so let us see uh, what happens in there so sterilization can be effectively achieved at temperature above 100 degrees celsius so what happens uh, you know when water boils it, it starts to evaporate and produce steam so what if uh, in, it's in the atmospheric pressure so what if we increase this pressure if, if we raise the pressure so the boiling point will also increase okay so in autoclave what we do is we put the water uh, you know allow to boil it in a closed chamber but we start increasing the pressure so the pressure when we increase the pressure the boiling points also increases so the temperature can go uh, well up to you know above 100 degrees celsius so uh, when we increase put a pressure of 15 pounds per square inch on into the autoclave machine so the temperature can reach and increase from 100 to 121 degrees celsius so the temperature is increasing more so there there are more chances of it sterilizing our uh, media sterilizing or glassware or sterilizing anything we want to sterilize so because now the steam that is being generated it is very hot steam than what comes from the boiling because we are having a very high temperature so here the temperature as well as the steam both work against the microbes so inside within so we have then we, we can keep them in a time period for usually uh, in books in general protocols it's 15 minutes but uh, when we use the autoclave in uh, we are used for 15 to 30 minutes and a normal range is 15 to 20 minutes okay so to destroy an infective agent associated uh, with uh, you know different kinds of microbes one uh, kind of uh, you know one kind of uh, pathogenic uh, problem is of the prions uh, we had, i have discussed in the previous lectures also about the prions so what are prions prions are like uh, if you have a protein and it and it's denatured okay so it starts to accumulate so proteins it makes and then it starts to accumulate so the prions are responsible for Alzheimer's disease they form beta amyloid plaques beta amyloid amyloid plaques beta amyloid plaques and they cause Alzheimer's disease as the person ages and he loses memory the same is a case with spongy form encephalopathies so in sp spongy form encephalopathies we talk about the brain and it you know the spirons you know just punch holes inside the brains and that's how the word sponge come into place so it punches the holes in our brain and this prions so they can be you know they can cause various neurological uh, disorders one of them is spongiform encephalopathies and another example i gave you about beta amyloid plaques in case of alzheimer's disease alzheimer's disease okay so in order to destroy them a normal uh, temperature uh, and this period, 15 minutes period it, it will not work to destroy them so for destroying the prions uh, we increase the temperature from 121 to 135 it is 9 and 5 is again 9 degrees celsius we increase it or uh, we keep the temperature same but we keep it for almost an hour usually we keep our uh, autoclaving for normal for 15 to 20 minutes here you have to keep you have to keep it for one hour, complete hour is recommended to destroy the prions so what are prions again prions are the proteins which are lost their structure and then they try to accumulate inside the brain we call them as plaques p l a q u e s 
okay now what are the advantages uh, sorry what are the advantages and uh, types of autoclave so advantage of the autoclave is it has a more penetrating power it means it can penetrate uh, the spores also so after the heat is uh, you know the uh, you switch off uh, the uh, so the uh, steam the steam then uh, cools down on the uh, uh, releases the latent heat and draws in fresh steam inside so because of the condensation this is one advantage Another is it moistens the spores, make it soft them, and allow them to germinate. When they germinate, they get susceptible to killing. Very easy because and then finally they coagulate the proteins, and that leads to the death of the microorganisms. Now we have three types of autoclaves uh, in your diagnostic lab. You might have this some simple pressure cooker like uh, you know uh, pressure cooker like autoclave. That's his. So it has a lid, put the things inside, close the lid, set up the temperature, set up the pressure and let it generate the steam. So when you plug it in, when you plug this in, so it takes some time for the water to boil because now it cannot boil at 100 degree. Now the, because of high pressure, it reaches first the temperature of 121 and then starts producing steam. Then we have a steam jacketed downward displacement. This is a very big autoclave. I have worked my whole PhD on this autoclave. It is fixed between the two walls. So we have the autoclave from this side also and it has an opening from the other side also. So what we used to do is uh, first we used to switch on. First was to switch on. And then we had to put on the heater. And the heater here is the place where the water used to be. So it, it boils and it reaches the outer chamber of the autoclave. So when it boils, the then we when we uh, after half an hour or say 45 minutes, we change uh, the setting here and then this uh, moisture uh, it enters the inner jacket. So when it enters the inner jacket, all the articles are present. What we want to sterilize are present here. So that is how they help us in getting our things sterilized. So we used to put uh, particularly um, 7H9 media. 7H9 media is particularly used for uh, you know 7H, uh, 7H9 broth media, particularly used for growing mycobacterium tuberculosis. So first of before we can grow them, we need to do to sterilize this media in order to you know in order to make it sure that our media doesn't contain any other microbes. Okay, this was just an example. Okay. Then we also have high pressure pre vacuum uh, uh, autoclaves. These are now uh, the latest technology has come in because uh, in autoclaves you have free air, and when well, once the uh, you know uh, pressure builds in or the steam comes in, it removes the uh, fresh air. So it is already pre vacuumed. So if it's pre vacuumed, so we don't uh, need you know the process can be done uh, very efficiently and in a very less time. So we call we call them as bench top bench top autoclaves so they are now the latest technology okay now uh, as I told you the structure of uh, autoclave and its function was already discussed in the previous slide so they can be either uh, vertical or they can be horizontal the structure I showed you in the last previous slide was the horizontal one so it has a heating element which can boil the water it has perforated trays to allow the steam to pass through a lid should be there screw caps, pressure gauge and safety valve and the discharge dam. So the articles that need to be sterilized we put them inside and we uh, fix up these screw caps and then uh, we allow the taps to the air, air the, to be displaced out and uh, then the, star appear starts, uh, the steam starts to appear. So the pressure is allowed to ri rise up to 15 lbs pounds per square inch and uh, 121 degrees Celsius for a period of 15 to 20 minutes. Once the <laughs> heater is uh, stopped, the autoclave is uh, 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 you know allowed to cool. So you will not try to even, even if you try to open uh, you know open the uh, the screws, it will not open because it takes uh, the steam takes time to vent uh, vent out from the. So until the steam is there, the autoclave will not open. So you have to wait and allow it for the cooling, and then you can open up the pressure gauge. And uh, when when it reaches atmospheric pressure, it's uh, lid is automatically automatically uh, you can open it or it can open or snow. Okay. So in this case, uh, what are the articles that are sterilized? I told you articles we can use is we can use broth. 
we can use uh, different kinds of media as for example in case of mycobacterium you can use 7h10 media 7h11 media in case of mycobacterium tuberculosis we can order clear the dressings of the patients so, and then you know, just throw them out and incinerate as i talked before we can use for certain equipments lining of patients who are covid positive we need to incinerate it or to play it first and then incinerate it and generally i mean to say burn it out so articles should be tightly packed i mean they should not be tightly packed because we need space and uh, it should not be overloaded because then the steam will not you know uh, easily move around and you know, you know sterilize all the things which are present so once the air discharge must be complete and uh, no air residue should be you know inside so when you uh, put the <laughs> bottles and other things inside you should loosen up their uh, you know you, uh, you should loosen up their caps because if you don't loosen up their caps uh, they will start to boil and you know the even uh, the the glass will the the, uh, the flask can burst in so you need to keep a small uh, air to open it so that when it heats up some you know uh, steam can get out of the uh, your uh, article okay or claim must not be opened i told you it will, it will not open of its own also uh, and one of, one of the things you keep it in uh, autoclave, for example, if you want to, you know, uh, autoclave the tips. So once you uh, put the tips inside your box, you should cover it uh, with a paper. Why? Because it gets drenched because of the steam. Okay. And then the tray in which you can uh, put uh, your uh, uh, tip boxes for autoclaving, which are uh, wrapped by paper. Okay. Are wrapped by paper all around. So the tray that you should use is. Uh, should have pores on the side because whatever water can accumulate it will go out and it will not wet wet or drench your autoclaved material for example tip boxes so advantage is very effective way of sterilization very quick also in 15 minutes you will get your results done but disadvantage is again i told you drenching wetting of your articles particularly your uh, you know uh, which are uh, which you uh, your uh, tip boxes and your tips uh, trapped air may reduce the efficiency so vacuum uh, type autoclaves are much better they are more efficient and uh, it takes long time to cool one of the <laughs> times but uh, patience always bears a fruit so you should patiently wait for the autoclave to you know cool down and then you are very much certain that your articles or materials are sterile so once they are sterile you can go up further with your experiments or diagnostics or whatever you want to do okay okay so again uh, here also we'll be using sterilization controls as we talked about the dry heat in the hot air oven so here also you can uh, you know you can use uh, the sterilization control so again we have physical methods of uh, physical methods for using control chemical methods and the biological method so again you have to confirm whether your article is sterilized or not so for that purpose what are you about to do so you will use this uh, automatic pressure process control is there, thermocouple is there, temperature chart is there which records the temperature. Chemical method uses this uh, Bowney tube one. It has a, it forms a black spot once black spot once the autoclave is over. You can use also succinic acid. When it melts, which melts uh, whose melting point is 121 degrees Celsius, and you can also use a Bowney dip tape. It changes color once the, uh, once the you know uh, your articles get sterilized. So you, if you um, just uh, if you stick this bounty uh, dick tape on your bottle, which needs to be sterilized, you will just stick it outside, and then you will see that once it's articleized, it, it forms like uh, dark brown strips are formed on its surface. So if there are no uh, dark uh, surfaces, you will not find it. It means the autoclave has not worked properly. So these are the indicators which tell you that yes, you are, uh, you know, the uh, article or whatever you have put for sterilization, it has certainly uh, sterilized. And then you go further up with your testing and the experiments which you want to do. So if the um, process has been satisfactory, you know, this as I told, brown strips, strips will of course also okay. The one, one another method of biological method is you can use paper strips. So again, this you have this uh, tube filled with broth. So you can just put a paper stick attached to it. And uh, this paper stick, it's like an envelope. Okay. And within this envelope, there will be around 10 plus 6. 
it means 1 million spores of uh, geobacillus stereothermophilus. So you will see that if you remove the stem and culture the stem, you, will, you should find that when you culture this, there should be uh, no growth in your media. So it confirms you that your article is uh, sterilized. Okay, it's a proper method. It's, I think it's one of the most, uh, you know, uh, relevant method. Otherwise, sometimes this coloration and sometimes may happen because of the wetting and all this coloration may not, uh, you know, happen properly. So if you if you want to chill it, uh, you know, chill, to ensure that yes, my article is confirmed, you can use this microorganism. Okay. So now uh, another way of uh, physical way of uh, sterilization and disinfection is vibration. In this case, we use a machine which you know uh, which releases out ultrasonic waves. So these are actually sound waves. You might have used you know in most of the uh, women who are pregnant, they use ultrasound to say uh, what stage the baby has reached. So here in case of uh, our microorganisms, we have this machine called ultrasonic machine so it is a method for sterilizing liquids uh, it vibrates and styling with, with the styling apparatus so having this uh, vibrating generation unit a vibration motor a rod so it becomes a fully operational unit and when the vibrating veins you know just vibrate the place uh, it vibrates all over this machine so if you put your things on the top of it so they will be you know they will be susceptible to this uh, vibrations and this ultrasonic and sonic waves uh, they have uh, ability the bactericidal powers means they have the ability to kill okay it's a sudden but uh, from lab to lab the results have been different they are variable and in such cases you know we are uh, microbes uh, you cannot say that uh, things are sterilized so microbes they also vary in sensitivity to this vibration some do survive so it means that overall if you think about overall sterilization uh, it has a least practical value in sterilization and uh, as thus it's not used in the uh, laboratories or research or you can say uh, your MLT labs so so far so now we have completed the physical part of our uh, uh, sterilization and disinfection in this lecture I think uh, you are you have been very patient with me uh, because this was a long lecture and that's why I had to break it in two parts uh, soon I will be meeting you uh, with a second part of it which will uh, take the other uh, parts that is chemical uh, way so uh, stay safe stay home and if you have any questions please do comment until I upload it on YouTube or you can provide your comments on the whatsapp group also so thank you very much.